Welcome to the place where people of faith find real answers. We believe women deserve more than just religious band-aids for their most difficult and destructive relationships. And now for today's episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Well, today we're going to talk about something that every couple deals with, and that is conflict. Some people deal with it better than others, but it's, it's tough no matter what kind of a marriage you have, even if it's a good one. When you get into these arguments, how do you fight fair? Leslie? You know, you said a couple of things in the intro that I would, you know, even your, your tone, Julie, was like, oh, conflict's awful. And conflict doesn't have to be awful. Conflict really? is part okay. of life. Yeah. Conflict is part of life. Conflict is part of being uniquely you and somebody else being uniquely them. And you don't agree on things. You don't see things the same way. Conflict should be about an issue, not attacking each other. So, so when it gets ugly and it gets draining, it might be because the conflict isn't really about an issue anymore. It's about who's wrong, who's right, who's, who's bad, who's good and attacking each other. And then it becomes very toxic. So I just want to say from the get go, I deal with women in horrible, abusive marriages for sure. But conflict doesn't make it a horrible, abusive marriage. My husband and I have plenty of conflict about different things. We're like night and day about certain topics and we just talk it through. And I don't always get my way and he doesn't always get his way. So I think there is a healthy way of navigating through conflict. You can't do it alone, but there is a healthy way. So let's not be afraid of the topic conflict or let's not be afraid of the reality of conflict. Let's not think that, oh, what's wrong with my marriage because we have so much conflict? Maybe nothing, but how you deal with conflict has everything to say about if you're going to get through it in a good way or not. Wow. Okay. That's a completely different mindset for me because, you know, when I think of my kids' conflict, it's always just stop fighting. And uh, maybe there's something that I could teach them as well. Okay. So some people I know go into conflict and it escalates very quickly. Maybe one person feels attacked, no matter how gingerly you try to approach a topic, especially a hot button topic. How do you keep it calm and from escalating? There's lots of different ways. There's no magic bullet that does that. But I think if you say to someone, hey, we have a hot topic to talk about. I know it's in the past brought up ugliness between the two of us, and I don't want that. And I know you don't want that. What would be a good way, a safe way for both of us to kind of talk about the money issue? Or let's, what would be a good way to talk about, you know, whose house we're going to for Christmas, whatever the conflict is, the sex issue, whatever it is that you know is out there. What would be a good way for us to talk about that that would feel safe for you and for me so that we can come to a better place and understand each other and maybe solve this issue? That's the place to start talking about the way we deal with problems. And that's the same song, different verse every time, whatever the issue is, we keep playing this. You're wrong. I'm right. You're to blame. You're at fault. What's wrong with you? Know, all that kind of attacking, accusing, demeaning, diminishing, and that strategy will never resolve conflict. If you if you've had a bad history in the past of of arguing, maybe it's gone down a totally different direction than you ever wanted it to and you want to start fighting fair. But he keeps bringing up the past and pointing fingers and everything. How much should you talk about the past and when should it just be done and buried and you can start fresh? It depends. If they're not over the past, then maybe it's time to say, you know, you keep bringing this up. Why is this bothering you so much? When we get attacked, like, oh, you did this in the past, our first reaction is to get defensive and argumentative back, you know, doing that jade. I'm going to justify, argue, defend, and explain. Instead, I would say, you've already probably done all that. (laughs) It doesn't work. So instead, ask a curious question. This is really bothering you and you keep bringing this up. What's that about? And if you can ask it in a tone that doesn't sound like what's wrong with you that you keep bringing this up. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, is something still bothering you about what happened back then that we've never cleared up that we've never resolved? So what if it's something that you personally haven't gotten over in the past, and you try to talk to him about it, and he sees it completely different, and there's not a way to resolve the past? How do you deal with that and move forward? There's a couple things. One is you have to be committed to how you are going to show up in a conflict, right? So the only side of the street that you can keep clean is your side. 
You can't keep playing their side. So if you've made a decision, um, and we'll talk about this in another episode, but from our core self, our big circle, if you've made a decision, I'm going to show up in this conflict or in this in this problem, whatever this problem is, because it usually results in a conflict. I'm going to show up in a respectful, curious, and generous way versus defensive, argumentative, attacking, accusing way. It can't really deteriorate because it takes two for things to deteriorate. Right now, if he's getting abusive and unkind and all that, and you're not responding or retaliating in any way, I think what you can say is, I can see you're really upset right now. And I don't think it's wise for us to continue this conversation. So I'm not saying sit there like a sitting dock and let yourself be berated. Mm -hmm. But then the conversation itself is over, right? Because you're not going to let yourself be treated that way. So, so I think part of the decision of at least one person, if you're going to change the cycle of the conflict. So if we would map out when I used to do Christian counseling with marriages, I used to map out, right? This is how you do conflict. Someone says an issue, then the other disagrees, and then you attack and accuse and blame and, you know, and deny and fight. And you don't really resolve the conflict. And you do that, whether it's about sex or whether it's about money or whether who, who, who lost the shoes of the kids. I mean, it's whatever it's about, the pattern of the way you talk to each other is the same. You know, I'm not talking about necessarily destructive marriages, but all kinds of marriages. The first question I would ask them is, have you ever had a time in your marriage where you had a conflict that you resolved in a good way? Or was there ever a time in your marriage or in your relationship that you had a problem that you worked together in a good way? What was the best way you did that? What was, what was it about that that worked? Because I can guarantee you, you're not doing those things now. Right. Right. So when you think about a 10-year marriage or a five-year marriage, there must have been some problem, maybe a noisy neighbor, you know, how are we going to solve this problem? And that you worked on it together and you did it in a constructive good way. And it felt good. And you felt like a, we not like we're attacking each other. And so learn from that. Like, wow, we do things differently. Sort of like the weight thing, you know, when I'm losing weight and I'm in shape and I'm feeling better, what am I doing different than when I'm feeling like a couch potato and blubbery and overweight? Well, I'm definitely eating different and I'm exercising different. So asking yourself those questions of, you know, when was I at my best? When were we at our best? in solving problems. And what was that like? Can kind of help the wheel turn a little bit to say, we're capable. We're capable. What's going on that we're defaulting to this yucky pattern? Leslie, how do you deal with a guy that feels if he agrees with you, he's giving in? And he doesn't want to do that. And so he feels like, I just got to stand up to you. How do you deal with that type of an attitude? First of all, to acknowledge that you are not going to change anybody's thinking. Right? So what would be different if you just accepted it? What if you accepted that for whatever reason in his development, He's done being a passive person. He's done being a people pleaser. He's done being, you know, an accommodator. And he might say, kissing your butt, right? Whatever, however he right. puts it, right? <laughs> He's done with all that. He's going to be a man. Maybe that's part of his journey. And maybe right now he's a little over the top with that. What would it be like for you to say, okay, I accept that you don't agree with me or you don't want to say that. What would you like to do? So now you're not fighting him on accepting your point of view. You're accepting that he sees it different or he doesn't want to do that. So how do we solve this problem? If you don't want to mow the grass and I don't want to mow the grass, what do you, what would you like to do about our grass? How would we solve that problem? Or uh, put up the Christmas lights. Or if you <laughs> don't want to put up, yeah. Yeah. So if you don't want to put up the Christmas lights, I respect that. And I can't put up the Christmas light because I'm not tall enough and strong enough and I'm not climbing up those ladders. So does it, does it, is it important to you to have Christmas lights? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's important to you. So if it's not important to you and you don't want to do it, I think I'll hire someone to put up Christmas lights. Or maybe we don't need to have Christmas lights. I'll share a story that my husband and I would fight. My whole family would fight over this the whole Christmas season. I grew up without much fanfare around Christmas time. And so, of course, when I got married, I was going to create this Norman Rockwell Christmas picture. I mean, the whole works. We lived in Pennsylvania. It was snowing. We were going to go and cut down our tree with a real axe. Right. Right. 
put it up and it was a, you know, 14 foot tree because we had, you know, tall ceilings and we made homemade Jesus ornaments. And I mean, so much work on my part because I'm the one who has to create this. Of course, everyone has to cooperate because I can't put up a 14 foot tree by myself. I can't get up the ladder and do all that by myself. I can't string the lights on that. So of course I'm like, we got to do this. And well, you know, it's too close to Christmas now. We're not going to have this done and blah, 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 blah. And everybody was like, not want, nobody wanted to go out and cut down a tree, but me, nobody wanted that big of a tree, but me, nobody cared whether everything was decorated the way I wanted it to be. Nobody cared if we made a cake for Jesus on his birthday. Nobody cared about the things that I cared about. Right. So I, I had to decide, am I going to do it my, all myself? Cause I care about it with a good way, good spirit, hire people, whatever, cause it's important to me. Or am I going to not have to have a Norman Rockwell Christmas looking Christmas. Cause what would we do is we'd have this beautiful Christmas and everybody would be like. Afraid to touch anything. Afraid to touch anything. Afraid to say anything because everybody was so cranky and crabby. Right. Like we had to take videos for the grandma because, you know, she lived out of town. And so we wanted to make sure she understood. So we took videos of us decorating the tree. They were so embarrassing because everybody's yelling at each other. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I feel like you've been in my house. I couldn't send them to grandma and grandpa because like, no, I don't want them. I'm tired. <laughs> Get up here and help you selfish kid, you know, kind of thing. And I, so grew up, I, I grew up near Yosemite and yeah. the place I worked would give us a pass where we could go into the forest and cut one down. I, mm-hmm, and yeah. we did that in the snow and it was literally a Christmas vacation thing. The thing would not fit in the house because yeah. they look a lot smaller in the wild mm-hmm. than yeah. they do in the house. So yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. And so it was, so one day, year, this was my coming out. Like, I don't need to do this anymore. We had this 14 foot tree. It was so heavy and so tall that we had to put a toggle bolt to the wall because the oh, tree was wow. tipping because the stand was not strong enough to hold this big tree. <laughs> so we had a toggle bolt. I was in the dining room and all of a sudden I heard this. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. The wall <laughs> came out of the wall. The whole 14 foot tree came down all the handmade dough ornaments cracked and broke. Oh no. And we had no tree. No, you know, so the next year we got a littler tree. My husband put the lights on. Nobody wanted to decorate the tree with me. And I said, okay, we didn't decorate the tree. Nobody decorated the tree. There was not an ornament on that tree. And guess what? We had a perfectly lovely Christmas without any ornaments. It was fine. It was fine. And so some things are just not worth fighting for. And so if it's important to you, figure out how you can do it without help or higher help. Or ask if, like I said to my family, finally, what's most important to you for Christmas day and Christmas? What's most important to all of you? And it wasn't like mine wasn't important, but what's most important. And none of that decorating was important to them. They didn't care if the house had three Christmas trees that were all fancy decorated, that we had wreaths on the windows and little candles on the window, you know, all the New England kind of stuff. They did. That wasn't important. What was important to them was peace, fun, having a great Christmas breakfast that my husband would make every year, presents. And that we would have a good time as a family. That's all that was important to them. And because everything else was so important to me, I couldn't give them those things because I was so mad and cranky right? because I was doing all those things with resentment. And so I had to decide, am I going to, how do I want to show up for Christmas? And do I want to do these things with a goodwill and kind spirit and say, this is my blessing to you, Norman Rockwell pitcher, and I'm still going to be happy and nice. Or am I going to say, I got to give this up if I want to be peaceful and happy on Christmas day. So you talked about if it gets heated or, or he's calling names or it's just going circular to maybe take a break. What if you have somebody that just takes a break and acts like everything's fine, nothing gets resolved, and that's just the way that they want to do it. And if you try to bring it up again, it just doesn't, doesn't go well. How do you handle a person that just doesn't want to talk about issues. So there are people who are conflict avoidant because they, their experience of conflict is just like you said, it's horrible. So if their experiences, every time we bring up a touchy issue, I lose my cool and make a fool out of myself, or you blame and accuse and attack me. Why would I want to talk about this again? And I can understand that I'm not totally conflict avoidant, but I'm that kind of conflict avoidant. I grew up with that. I don't want to do that anymore. And I just refuse. So if somebody were continuing to bring up something to me, and every time we try to talk about it, it turned into an ugly moment or ugly hour or ugly day or ugly week, I probably would do the same thing and say, I don't want to talk about it. And so mm-hmm. I think that starting with a different approach, instead of saying, let's talk about 
this problem with money that we have, or let's talk about the kids. We've never talked about it. We never finished. We always argue about it. You know, I need to know an answer. Are we sending the kids to a Christian school or, you know, whatever the problem is. I think it's better to say something like, I know this has been a tough topic for us to get through. And we have been pretty ugly toward each other, or, you know, maybe he's been ugly to you and you've just been passive or you've been ugly to him and he's been passive. However, it's been, look at the dynamic and just say, I don't want that to happen. Um, But I know this is an outstanding problem. We have to decide what we're going to do. I mean, time's ticking away. So how would you feel safe talking about this? Would it be in writing or would it be that we aren't, can we set some rules or some ground rules? Or maybe we can set a timer. We can only talk about it for five minutes. There's lots of creative ways of saying, how can we create safety here? You know, so that both of us can share our point of view. And maybe that's all we do. We don't solve the problem. We just share our point of view. And it's very different. Mm-hmm. But we're honest and we share our point of view. And then each of us go to our own corner and, and think about that and pray about that and see, you know, is there any merit in the other person's point of view? Instead of me feeling like I've got to win this person over to my point of view, maybe by just listening carefully and respectfully to the other person's point of view about the subject, like I want to send my kids to a Christian school and I don't want to send my kids to a Christian school or whatever the topic is. Um, to be able to talk about that and why and ask good questions and then agree to not resolve it until both of you have really hurt each other and go off and pray and think about it. How do you keep the topic to the topic? Because I know even in, in my marriage, we can start off talking about one thing and then we are five miles from that topic. And I feel like it goes in a million circles dealing with other things before we can get to the topic at hand. What are some ways that you can stick to the issue? I think when you know you have problem in certain areas, or you know that you can get anxious or controlling or cranky, if you know yourself well enough, and I'll give another person example. I know that if I go on a family vacation with a lot of family members, or if I go even on a vacation with just my family, I know myself enough to know that I am a control freak when it comes to what are we doing and when are we doing it? And if nobody plans that, it drives me crazy because then it's all defaulting to me. And I don't want to have to take all of that responsibility either. So I know already that because we've had bad vacations (laughs) because of that, right? Mm -hmm. So to be able to say, hey, we're going on a family vacation or my kids will come up to the cabin that we have. What's really important for you to do? And sometimes they'll say, you know what? I just want to relax. I don't want to have an agenda. And I'm like, oh, I mean, we don't have to plan horseback riding and ice cream cones and, you know, dinner out and you just want to relax and do nothing. Yeah, that's all I want to do. If I want to watch TV all weekend, that's all I want to do. Just by asking that question helps me to relax. Like, okay. I don't have to get all this agenda in order to make you happy or to have have you have a good time. You've told me what you need. I can do that or I can't do that. And it just helps me calm down and not worry about it as much. So so I think knowing yourself and what it is that you need out of this conversation um, to be able to say, you know, I know that we need to talk about the kids tuition. It's coming up. And every time we talk about it, we end up talking about how I overspent the checkbook and how you bought that car and you shouldn't have bought it or whatever the topics are that are part of the anger about why we don't have enough money for this. Right. And I promise that I'm not going to bring up any of that stuff because that's maybe a topic for another conversation. But right now we have a problem to solve. And that is how are we going to come up with the tuition money for our kids semester? not about blaming each other for not being smart enough to save for it or being stupid and spending all those kind of things that we usually go to, but how do we solve this problem together so that we can be feel good about having our kids tuition in place when the bill is due. So if you can help someone feel like, here's what the conversation's about, and it's not going to go here and it's not going to go here. It's only going to last for so long. Like my kids sometimes don't like me talking to them because it can go on and on and on. When we were teenagers, they would say, mama, listen to you for five minutes. And that was okay. Now I have a boundary and they were listening and I had to stop. And so I think those are ways, mm -hmm, those are ways to make it safe for them to give you what you need. I want you to hear me. And I don't want to hear you for two hours. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Okay. I, I'm trying to imagine my kids saying that to me, how I would receive that. (laughs) What if you come to an agreement 
you have a good conversation and you feel like, okay, he's going to do this and I'm going to do this. And then he never follows through with what he promised. That can make a person pretty angry, rightfully so. How do you handle that when someone's not following through with what they said? Yeah, uh, that happens in my home too. So I think you have to be careful of the story you tell yourself. All right. So that happened just recently in my home. My husband doesn't follow through on stuff he said. And if I look at his overall pattern, he's very trustworthy. He's very reliable. He's very caring. It's tempting in those moments to tell myself a story. He doesn't care about me. He, you know, I asked him to do this and he didn't do it. Here's an example. He gets the groceries and I eat this salami and cheese mixture. It's like rolled up in a tube and I just cut two slices off and I have that for lunch because I'm really eating quick and I'm just, it's easy to eat it fast and it fills me up. It's got enough fat and protein in it that it fills me up. And he eats all kinds of stuff that he buys for himself, pot pies and soups and all that kind of stuff. So I go to get my salami and it's gone. And I said, did you eat my salami? He goes, yeah, I had it for lunch. I said, you have 15 pot pies in the (laughs) refrigerator, in the freezer that you can have. And you took my one thing that I eat. And I was tempted to go with a story. You don't care about me. Right. Right. But that's not true. I mean, he said, oh, I'll get this. I, forgot. I just didn't think of, you know, he wasn't. So he's not a proactive thinker that way. Like I plan my day, like I'm going to do this, this. He doesn't, he doesn't think that way. So I think we just have to be careful of the story we tell ourselves when our husband isn't reliable. But I think you could ask a question to say, hey, and, and we talked about a man who's a people pleaser. So, hey, I know that you tend to want to make me happy. And so you say yes in the moment. And then you don't follow through. And then I get mad at you and that's a bad cycle we're in. So I'd really invite you to be totally honest with me. If you don't want to do something or you don't think you're going to have time for it, for whatever reason, I'd much rather you be honest and say, I really don't want to put those Christmas lights up, or I really don't want to do that, or I don't want to save money this way or whatever it is. And then we'll figure out a different solution that you actually can follow through it. Or that would be one approach or another is, you know, I've noticed a pattern of you committing to things and then not following through. What, what's that about? Well, I just forget. Okay. Do you understand that that makes me feel like I'm not sure I can trust that you're going to do something? It makes me anxious that you say you're going to pay the bill. You say you're going to pick the kids up from school or you say you're going to mow the lawn tomorrow and then it doesn't get happen. And I, I get stressed about that. So in his character, his virtues, his values, does he want to be a trustworthy, reliable person? And doing something or saying something and not doing it or not following through is not reliable. So that's breaking trust in a relationship. I have one more question. And people may not even know what this term is. I think most people do. But uh, how do you deal with gaslighting? Gaslighting is what we're seeing in the news where you can't really believe the narrative (laughs) because it's twisted to form a certain agenda. Yes. And so gaslighting is... When, you know, someone might distort the truth or outright lie about something in order to create a storyline or a narrative um, that isn't reality, but it's close enough to potential or possible reality that you get confused, that you feel uncertain. So here would be an example. I washed my hands and I put my ring on the, on the sink and I know I did that and it's not there. Mm-hmm. And your husband comes in and he says, I didn't see it. Maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't put it there. Maybe you put it in the bathroom. No, I I distinctly remember thinking, oh, I better put it in the soap dish so that it doesn't get accidentally dropped down the drain, but my ring's not there. I don't know. You know, you must be losing your mind. I think you're getting old. Maybe you're getting Alzheimer's. I don't think I'm getting Alzheimer's. I know I put my ring here. And then he comes back from the bathroom and it's here it is. But the reality was you did put it there, but he took it and put it there. So that it made you feel crazy, a very intentional distortion of something or misrepresentation of something or a completely deceitful something to make you question your reality. I know we agreed to X, Y, Z. We never agreed to that. I never said that. I don't know what you're talking about. I feel like you're too fl- flirty with your secretary. I'm not too flirty. You're imagining things. You're, you're crazy. And so This discounting, denying, distorting, rewriting, fudging with reality that makes you think, oh, 
maybe I am going crazy. Maybe I am overreacting. Maybe I am too sensitive. And maybe you are sometimes. Right. So I'm not saying whenever that happens, you never self-reflect, but this is what a healthy person does. When someone challenges their version of reality, you do self-reflect. Like you say, oh, maybe I am being too harsh or maybe I am being too controlling or, or you know, things like we've talked about. But when that's a regular pattern, when the deflection is always you're the crazy one and I'm the one who's the guru or I'm the one who knows what's talking I'm talking about or you're always wrong and I'm always right. When that's the overall pattern of the relationship, like if we think about politics right now, the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democrats are always bright shining lights and the saviors of the world and the Republicans are, you know, trying to do this or <laughs> if you listen to a different the news reverse, station. Right. Yeah. So, so it's always demonizing and crazifying and it's a very dichotomy split mindset where someone is the good guy and someone's the bad guy. Someone's right. Someone's wrong. And when that's the pattern in a relationship, a lot of gaslighting is going on. Well, I think that's really hard when somebody's doing that to you, because I know I get into the place of, well, I've got to prove that I'm right. I've got to prove that what you're saying isn't true. And that doesn't ever go anywhere. No, <laughs> so No, no. And I think that's where it's really important for you to decide and, and, and this is really important for our, for our listeners, for you to decide, how do I want to show up for me? And if I'm starting to question my own mind, because this person in my life is telling me I'm crazy, or I'm getting Alzheimer's, or I'm forgetting everything, or whatever, or I agreed to something that I'd never agreed, remembered agreeing to, or I did something that I never remember doing, or they didn't do something that I told them that they did, all those kind of things, I would start writing things down. This is what right. I did. This is what I said. This is what we agreed to. So that a week later, when he says that never happened, I can go back and say, I know it happened. I'm not going to convince him because he has an agenda, just like the Republicans aren't going to convince the Democrats. If only they tell him this is what it's true. They're going to go, oh, my gosh, yeah, I'm so wrong. Or the Republicans tell the Democrat, uh, you know, Democrats, no, this is the truth. Oh, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. It's not going to happen because they have a different agenda. But at least, you know you know, no, I didn't say that. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't lose it that way. And so you're keeping yourself clear and sane and strong. And you can't convince someone who doesn't want to be open to a new point of view. See, if you have an agenda that you have to be right, because you want the power and control, and we see it very clearly politically right now, Right. That you have to be right. You can't be open to feedback. You can't be open to changing your mind or even another person's perspective because then you lose power, right? So if you're in that mindset, then you're not going to change someone's mind because you're not really having a conversation. You're having a debate and someone's going to win and someone's going to lose and it's going to be you. So the person that you don't want to lose is you in your own mind. And so you're not going to convince him, but you have to be clear with you. Let's talk about yelling really quick. I had a discussion with my husband you know, he's big guy, baritone voice, and it's me and three girls. And so he doesn't, I don't think even realize when he's raising his voice, but mm -hmm. I don't like the yelling. And his, his perspective is it's impossible to not yell. Everybody yells. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Um, I would say that the majority of people when they're angry have a change of voice tone. Okay. So when you're angry, if I were to say to you, Hey, Julie, I am so angry at you right now. That just wouldn't sound right. Would it? Right. No. Right. So either I'm going to say, Julie, I'm really mad now or stop it. I'm going to raise my voice. Right. Or I'm going to say it in a very firm way. Stop it right now. And my face muscles will change, right? right? Because I want to be crystal clear. I mean, business, whether I'm talking to my child or whether I'm talking to somebody else, I'm not going to say, you know what, I just need to tell you, I'm really mad at you. It just <laughs> doesn't match, right? No. So your husband's right in that when you're angry about something, your voice tone and your posture changes, what comes out of your mouth. I'm not thinking of the, the tone is as important as the words. Right. So if I say I'm really mad right now, stop it. That's very different than saying you SOB, you deserve to die. Right? Right. Right. So when you're using words and you're using abusive speech and put down language and attacking and accusing and reviling, you can say that with a voice tone that's like this. I think you're a jerk. And it right. still can be very hurtful. And I can yell at the top of my voice, stop it, don't go out in that street. 
right? right? And I'm not wanting to attack someone. I'm just communicating something in a strong way. So what if the words are hurtful? What if there is cussing? And is that when you just take a time out and say, you know, I'm not going to be around. I'm not going to be called those names. If someone was attacking me with their words, whether they were talking softly or whether they were talking in a berating loud tone, I would say my, my standard was not doing that anymore. I grew up that way my whole life. (laughs) I'm not letting myself be treated that way anymore. When you can calm down and speak constructively, I'm all ears. Right. And I would just exit the situation. So you have to find your own boundary around that. But to be a willing victim of someone else's vomit all over you right. um, isn't, isn't appropriate. However, if someone raises their voice in a moment of intensity, um, but they're still speaking words that aren't attacking and accusing, but they're just really mad right now, it might be uncomfortable, but it might be something you can live with. Okay. I keep thinking that was the last question. Then I, as you're talking, I have one more passive aggressive. How do you deal with somebody who's a passive aggressive? Because it tends to drive you a little crazy, maybe like gaslighting would. Yeah. I mean, again, you can't change someone else. You can't change someone else. And so I would say two things. One is understand the limitations of a relationship when you're dealing with someone who's not willing to look at themselves. Right. When, when you're dealing with a, when you're having a relationship with a boss or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife or a coworker or a pastor or anybody in this world, your child who is not willing to look at themselves or you're not willing to look at yourselves, growth in that relationship is impossible. Right. Because that's how we grow by looking at ourselves. So we look at our, like one of my grandchildren just got uh, a, a bunch of math problems wrong on a test. And she's really a good, she's really a good little student. And her teacher handed her paper back and he said, this is not your best work. Now that's very painful feedback for a super achiever in school Yes, who did really bad on a test. But she had to look at herself, like what's going on that I did such a horrible job on this math test, right? Because you can't grow if you don't look at yourself. If she just got mad at him and I'm not going to school and I'm not taking any more tests and we're not talking about this, then she wouldn't have had that opportunity to grow. So in order to grow, you have to look at yourself, especially when you fail or you do something wrong, right? If you're not willing to do that, then there's no growth in interper- interpersonally or personally. So you're living with a passive aggressive person or you're in a relationship with a passive aggressive person and they're trying to communicate to you in very passive ways that they're angry without saying I'm angry. But if you call them out by saying you're just being passive aggressive, they're going to get defensive and they're going to shut down. Right. If you call them out and say, I sense you're trying to tell me you're angry in very um, soft ways. Do you want to talk about it? And then they can decide. Are they going to come out of the passive and move into more of the assertive? Or are they going to stay passive? You're inviting them to grow. But you're not calling them out in a shameful attacking way. You're calling them out in an inviting to grow way. Like her teacher said, hey, this isn't your best work, right? So he's inviting her to look at herself. He didn't say, I didn't know you were so stupid. (laughs) Oh, gosh. You know, he just says, this isn't, because he says, I know you're capable of better than this. So what's going on? Right. Right? And so she had to decide, was she going to look at what's going on? Because she knows she's capable of better than this or not. We can invite people into growth or we can you know, just call them out on their stuff. How do you know when it's gone from normal marriage arguments to this is destructive? Well, I think we would look at the patterns. So are there patterns of abuse, verbal or otherwise? Are there patterns of controlling behavior where you can't be yourself? You can't have a voice. You can't dissent. You can't say no, you can't disagree without a price to pay. Are there patterns of deceit, whether it's financially or morally or other things, there's patterns of you don't know what's going on. Trust is broken. He's lying to you. Those kind of patterns. Are there patterns of indifference where you're in trouble and you call him and he says, call AAA on the road, or maybe you are having stomach problems and you want to go to the emergency room and he says, call an Uber. Those are two examples of real life stories. Um, you come home from the hospital and you need some attention, you know, you you're sick and you're in your 
bed and he never checks on you to see if you need something to eat or drink. Um, and you're like by yourself and like, does he even think about me? Does he even care about me? There's this pattern of indifference. Like I don't care about what you need or what you want or who you are. As long as you serve me, we're good. So I think that those patterns are more in the destructive area. And if they continue, they will be destructive, certainly to a marriage, but they sometimes can be destructive to your health and your own well-being. And it's very important for you to understand that God's not asking you to be in a relationship with a destructive person who's out to destroy you. He calls you to steward your heart, mind, and body. And if someone is harming you physically, you would protect yourself in some way. If they're harming you in other ways, you need to have good boundaries and protect yourself against that. Well, Leslie, thank you. You've given me, and I know our listeners a lot to think about when it comes to the issue of conflict. And to help with that, you've written eight steps to resolving conflict. And we're going to offer that as a bonus to our listeners. And you can find that document in the show notes. And I would really encourage you to take a look and read that and begin to try to apply some of these steps in your life. And like you said, you can't apply them to his, unfortunately, but we can apply them to, to us and see what kind of a change that makes in a relationship. Is there anything else you want to say on the topic of resolving conflict? The Bible says that as much as it depends on us, be at peace with everybody. And that's what we really want. We, we want to connect, even if we don't connect deeply with people, we want to be at peace with them. We don't want to be at war with people. We don't want to be either in a defense mode or an attacking mode. At least I hope you don't want to be in attacking mode, but you know, so God calls us as much as it depends on you. But the reality is that you can't fix someone else. So often we focus on trying to get them to change, stop being so passive aggressive, stop being so unreliable, stop, you know, doing this or start doing this or start being nicer, lower your voice tone or stop arguing, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to get someone to do to make our life better. And what the real question is, is we need to do what we need to do to make our life better. And that is may include having a tough conversation with someone without accusing or attacking them. But hey, the way we do conflict is so stressful to me that I can't live at peace like this anymore. The way we do life together is so hurtful to me. I can't continue to do life like that. What can we do differently? It hasn't always been like this, or we have better moments. What do we do differently when we have better moments? And maybe the truth is you don't have better moments. Mm. You're always living in a war zone. You're always feeling tense. You're always feeling put down and dismissed and degraded and deceived. And if that's true, then you're living like a prisoner of war in a concentration camp. And that is not described as a biblical marriage. And so please don't think that God wants you to suffer and sacrifice to stay married at the expense of your physical, emotional, financial, sexual, and spiritual safety and well-being. Good words. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to hit that follow button. And we would appreciate if you would leave your honest rating and review of this podcast. Well, until next time, may God bless your mind, your heart, and your home.